Good morning, y'all. I think it's time for a garden devotional. Every time I share one of these videos where I talk about Jesus and faith, um, it never fails. I get a handful of comments of people saying, why don't you do this on a separate channel? Um, what does this have to do with gardening? This channel is a channel where I share my life. And I used to try to keep my faith separate from my farm, from my businesses, from all of the different things that I did. And as a daily vlogger, somebody who posts almost every single day, it would be, to me, um, it would be impossible to be able to do this job with any measure of sincerity if it were separated up. Um, because what happened whenever I did that, whenever I separated out my faith because someone didn't like it, or whenever I would share the faith-based stuff on Facebook and I wouldn't post my excitement about a garden or animals um, because the people who were there for the ministry, they didn't understand that. It, I didn't actually feel chosen by anybody. I didn't actually feel valued. And, you know, I, I'm kind of of the belief that our world would be a tremendously better place if people would choose people for all that they are and instead of trying to cut them up and take what they want instead trying to understand it you know there are multiple people who are faithful viewers to this channel who are not believers who leave comments that have a very different belief system than me but have decided to stay based on the common ground and have decided to stay because they see value beyond the place where we disagree and those commenters are precious to me i mean all the commenters are precious to me all the viewers are precious to me but I'm so thankful whenever people are willing to look for understanding and relationship beyond the point of agreement. And so I still do devotionals. That is part of who I am. And I testify to the goodness of God from this platform that he stood me on because he's my best friend because his goodness has truly been the most transformational thing in my life. And so, yeah, I want to, I want to talk about it. And I've decided that I'm going to lay all of this beautiful life out like a buffet and if someone wants to walk out of the restaurant because one dish is served on the buffet that they don't like then I bless them to go find what they want somewhere else. I, it's, it's okay because I'm, you know, if somebody doesn't want to see a devotional pop up in their feed, it's okay. Um, that's their choice. They have the choice for themselves, just like I have the choice for myself. But I, I want to implore the people who don't agree, just like look for understanding instead of agreement. You have such a richer life if you view people as valuable no matter what they, what they believe in, and then look for the understanding of their heart instead of agreement. And that goes to all the people who are believers too. I mean, like if you will minister to people who don't think like you with the mindset that you want to understand where they are, you want to understand their brokenness, you want to understand their hurts, you want to understand their desires and their hopes and their passions. It's a much more powerful ministry because you're actually caring about people. That was just a little bonus, something that I wanted to talk about before I got in to the topic for today. Today, the topic of this video, um, it's about a phrase in short, but it's really about a language and a mindset. My husband's mom died uh, six weeks ago. And when somebody dies unexpectedly in your life, um, just, you know, when it happens just out of the blue, and I don't know what it's like when you expect it, because the, the people that that have died in my life that it was like I was ready for it. They were all, um, they were all really advanced in age. Like they had lived a full life and it was a really hard loss, but this was different. Like I'm going to be honest, like her dying at 60, I mean just 60, that's not, that's not a full life. And for her to have just died so unexpectedly when we thought we had more time, it's one of those things that just, it lays bare everything you believe and says, do you still believe this? This is what happens whenever you experience a loss like this. Now, five years ago, almost, um, we bought our house. We'd moved into our house on April 27th of 2014. And while the U-Haul was in the driveway, I mean, like an hour after we unloaded, I was grilling on the back porch, a tornado came and it hit about three miles from here. There was a family that was really close to us that lived um, 
near us and I was so excited to move out here and be their neighbors and um, because our boys were best friends. They had two sons that were the same age as my oldest boys, Jackson Asher. They were seven and eight at the time. And um, that tornado hit their house and, and those boys died that night. And um, their mom, who's one of my really good friends, ended up in a wheelchair for a few months. And we were really close to that situation. Maya was one of the first people on the scenes, actually found them. Like it was, it was, we were really close to the situation. That was my first experience of what I believed being laid bare and me being asked, do you really believe this? Um, and I wanna be really transparent about the process of being laid bare and being asked, what do you believe? Because I think that if we only present the other side where we're stronger and we're certain in what we believe, I think that we run a risk of isolating the people who are still in that process. And I don't ever wanna do that. Like I want, I want to expose the weakest parts of my own process so that in the weakest parts of yours, you know that you're not alone in them. I considered, I mean, as a, just a lifelong believer, really having encountered God in an incredible way. Um, I'd been healed, like medically documented healed in a miraculous way. I have been through some things with the goodness and the grace of God. And I, after the tornado, and this is so silly, like when I think about it now, I'm like, it just puts into such perspective how small we are. Um, but I had a conversation with God about how I was considering not believing in Him. And I know that that sounds just ridiculous that you would talk to Him about not believing Him, but I did because that's what I was feeling. And so I talked to God about how I didn't know if I could believe in a God that lets bad things happen to good people. And as soon as I opened the door to that train of thought, um, you know, the enemy just came rushing in with all the bad things. I mean, just laid it out and it was as if I was in a courtroom and, you know, the accuser was standing, um, standing there making a case against the goodness of God. Well, how could he be good if there's sex trafficking and how can he be good if there are these children starving and how can he be good, you know, if there's this, if there's that and, and just all the horrible things and all of a sudden just the headlines and the news became a testimony against the goodness of God and all the things that were going on in our incredibly broken world was like, how could there be a God? if this is the, the truth of where you live, if this is the truth, if, if he loved people, would he allow this? My friend in the hospital room after her kids died testified to the goodness of God and that snapped me out of it. And that opened the door for a different level of encounter for me because I had to change and I had to stop looking at this earth from, from the perspective of somebody uh, where this was my, my, you know, the entirety of my walk, like that this was the entirety of my story. I had to look at this as the very beginning blip of an entirety that is eternity. That was really tested, you know, I haven't been through anything quite that, that great of a blow uh, until Maya's mom died in the last five years. I mean, we've been through some loss and some trials to be certain, um, but not the, not the kind that like is lifelong. You know, death is lifelong. It's not eternity long, but it's lifelong. This has been, this last six weeks has been, um, it's been another laying bare and saying, well, do you really believe that? I've been honestly incredibly thankful to find that I do uh, really believe it. I've been incredibly thankful. Uh, you know, I've dealt with some fear. We had to nip that in the bud. I mean, I got to the point that I was, I was so fearful that I didn't want to let my kids out of my sight just a couple weeks out of, after she died. And Maya actually came in one night and I was just a wreck. I was just, I was crying and shaking and just like thinking. Because again, that door opened to the thought process of what if and the thought process of the accusation of goodness of God. And when that door is open, it's a flood of accusation because the enemy is the accuser. And if he's got a single open door into your thought process where he might be able to you know, accuse God and take you out of agreement with the fact that God is in fact good and for you, 
he wants to. That's what he wants to do. I mean, he's, he he was so certain in the the worthlessness of God that he was willing to fall from heaven and fall from his presence for it. And, and now his goal is he's seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for someone that he can bring into agreement with his way of thinking, which is that God is worthless and um, not even worthy of our praise. And so, you know, Jeremiah came in with me that night and prayed. And I really had to come to the crossroads again, the same crossroads I had to come to after the tornado, of really relinquishing trust over my children and my family to him and saying, I, I trust you with them and I trust you with their eternity and I trust you with their hearts and their souls and I trust you um, to be the governing factor in their life and the hand of protection over them. Since then, things have been a lot easier. Um, but I want to talk to you today. That's just the reality of where I've been. I want to talk to you today about learning the language that shuts the door on the enemy. Um, because this is something that I had to learn after the tornado and it's something that I've had to put in play through a lot of struggles because the enemy's looking for an open door because what he wants more than anything is to take your worship away from God because then he feels like he's right and that God is not worthy of worship. And so that's what he's looking for in any situation. He's looking for an open door to steal your worship. After the tornado happened, I was pretty crippled as far as like devotion. Uh, before that, I had been um, very, very faithful and diligent in reading the Bible. Like that was just something that was a very huge part of my life before the tornado and it was restored at later but like when the tornado happened I was in such a place of confusion and hurt that sitting down and reading about people who felt very disconnected from it it didn't help me like it really didn't I didn't it didn't strike my heart it didn't stir me in any sort of deep way I would read it and I could read chapters and chapters and chapters and it kind of like it was hitting me on this level I don't know how to describe it other than that like I was processing it on this level, but nothing, nothing was hitting me here. Like, and, and if you've ever been hit here by the word of God, you know what I'm talking about. And it bothered me because I was used to being stirred in my spirit by the word. And so read, reading it and not being stirred made me not want to read it. And so I really kind of struggled in devotion and a man that was friends with my dad and we had hired him to come out and do some like excavation on our property. And he came out and he was talking to me and he said, do you read the Psalms and Proverbs every day? And I was like, I don't, you know, like, no, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, um, every day, I read the Psalms for that day and the Proverbs because there's 150 Psalms and there's 31 Proverbs and basically in a month, like today is the 10th, he would read like the 10th Psalm, the 20th, the 30th, the 40th and um, that's a lot, that's 15 chapters and so what, you know, I would break it up and just pick some, like I would read like 10, 20, 30, and 40, 50 and then on the 20th of the month I would read you know, the other even numbers, the first you read first, 11th, 21st, you know, like basically it's just kind of like a guide of go here. I started to do that in a time that I, I truly wasn't processing the word. I was in a place of desperation. I was laid bare. I, I was having a hard time making the choice to even believe in God. I was having a really hard time in shutting the door on fear um, because I went to a funeral with the boys who used to spend the night at my house and there were children. It wasn't something that was could be explained. It wasn't something that could be easily, you know, tucked away in any sort of religious mindset that we could still, you know, go to church on Sunday and say, amen, brother God is good, blah, 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 because I was feeling like he wasn't, because I was feeling like I was hearing all the accusations, I was seeing all the bad things in the world. And, and, and hearing my friend's testimony helped me a lot, but I still had a tremendous amount of fear. And I just couldn't process the word. I, could, I wasn't being moved. And here's the thing, if you are in that place, do you know the next move of the enemy after he's got the door open and he's got you flooded with hopelessness and despair and accusation against the goodness of God is then he comes and turns it around and he says it's because you're bad and because your faith is weak and because you don't have what it takes to really have strong faith. And then it's an accusation against your worthiness. He comes for God's worthiness and then he comes for your worthiness. And then the next thing you know, you're just resigned to just being bad and surviving the rest of your life. And that's what happens to people. I talk to so many people that are just in this place of resignation that they, you know, that maybe God is 
good, they're just not worthy of it. That robs the cross. That robs us of any hope of, of eternity, any hope of salvation, and any hope of life abundant. If we can, if we ascribe to that belief, we're completely robbed. Backtrack, um, reading the Psalms and the Proverbs. I started to read the Psalms every day, and the Proverbs, but really the Psalms was what did it for me. I would read about, you know, five to ten chapters a day, depending on how much time I had. And I, got a, I ended up getting a journal out. I like to journal my prayers. I've shared with that with you guys before. And what I would do is, I'm gonna get my phone out. I didn't bring my Bible down here. Today I'm gonna be reading out of Psalms 103. And this is one that's probably familiar to you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your inequities and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So that's Psalms 103, 1 through 4. I'm just going to use this as an example of how God taught me to bless the Lord with all of my soul. We're made in the image of God. He's a three-part being, Father, Spirit, and um, Son. And he made us with a spirit and with a soul and with flesh. And essentially, there's a battle going on over who's going to rule our soul. And the battle is between our flesh and our spirit. And essentially, the one that wins is the one you feed. When, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so a lot of times we sit down and we listen to sermons about we gotta stop watching those R-rated movies and we gotta do this and we gotta do that and we take on this level of condemnation of we're just so bad. But if we understood that basically what we're doing is we're, we're gorging ourselves on the world which makes the word taste bad to us and our flesh is getting strong and then our soul is being it's being uh, steered by our flesh instead of our spirit. But if we feed our spirit, if we feed our spirit the word, if we feed our spirit in worship, if we feed our spirit in devotion, if we feed our spirit in good solid teaching, and, and we feed our spirit in those things that make our spirit stronger, if we, if we strengthen our spirit by fasting, if we do these things, these are not things that we're supposed to do because if we don't do them, we're condemned. That's not how it works. We have been bought, we've been covered, we are called the righteousness of Christ. He has given us, He has made us His righteousness. And so we have the ability to go boldly into His presence. And and so there's so I, I don't want to go down too many rabbit trails here, but I want to make sure that I express this properly. He doesn't need you to fast to move His heart. He doesn't need you to read the Bible to move his heart. These are not things that we have to do to make him love us. Because in Song of Solomon it says a single gaze of the bride ravishes the heart of the groom. He, we look at him and it moves his heart. Not doing the right things we look at him and that moves his heart. Just in stillness we look at him and that moves his heart. And so in that confidence we need to look at it from a place of okay these things feed my spirit and these things feed my flesh. Strong spirit means my soul, which is my mind, my will, and my emotions, the entirety of my heart, my mind, my will, and my emotions. These things will be, if my spirit is leading, these things will be submitted to the government of Jesus. These things, my mind, my will, and my emotions, will be submitted to his mind, will, and emotions. However, if our flesh is strong and our spirit is anemic, what happens is, is that our mind, will, and emotions are governed by our flesh. They're governed by the, our weakness. And, and God comes in in those times. He comes in and He moves. He comes in and He talks to us. He comes in and He touches us because He's jealous for us. Even when we are, are that weak, He's made strong. I promise you, in the moments where the door was wide open in my life and I was completely given to the idea that maybe He wasn't good and maybe He wasn't for me, He came in those moments. And in my weakness, He was made strong. But my mind, my will, and my emotions were being completely governed by my doubt and my and, and I promise you in those times it was those were the overwhelming times but there have been a lot of times that there wasn't a circumstance there wasn't a death that I've gotten to that place that bad place of not being sure about things and of being scared and of feeling hopeless and of feeling despair there was no circumstance that got me there it was truly just the fact that my flesh was much stronger than my spirit in those moments because that's what I'd been feeding in my place of just dire weakness and in my place of just desperately wanting that door to close but not knowing how to make it happen. I learned to read the Psalms and I learned to pray them. And I, I, the Psalms became a textbook to me of language that is praise 
And praise aligns your mind, your will, and your emotions to your spirit. It just does. Praising God and making the choice. And there's a song called 10,000 Reasons. Somebody actually commented about this recently. And when I am having a hard time, this is the song I sit down at my piano and play. And it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship your holy name. It says, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. I didn't understand this song for a long time because I thought, bless the Lord, O my soul, what does that mean? Most of this song is speaking to yourself. Most of this song is saying, mind, come on thoughts. Come on choice, come on will, come on emotions, come on the way you feel. Stand up and bless the Lord. No matter what, stand up and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And over and over we hear David in times of desperation, in times of despair in the Psalms, blessing the Lord with his mind, will, and emotions despite his circumstances. All right, I moved because the sun was getting bright in my eyes. Whenever I learned to pray the Psalms, what happened was, is I began to learn this language from David, who truly was a hero in worshiping God and being a man after his own heart, no matter where he was circumstantially. David praised God in a shepherd field whenever he was ostracized by his family um, and forgotten. Remember, the prophet came you know, to anoint a king and David's dad didn't even acknowledge him until there was no other choice. Um, but he praised God in that place. He praised God facing giants. He praised God while being persecuted. He praised God in caves. He praised God through his sin. David praised God. He clung to God and he, and he fought with that thing of grabbing hold of his soul and putting it back in the right place of, of worship and acknowledgement. Of all the things David went through that could have caused his fall, because you know Saul was his, his father figure, he was his father-in-law, and he, and he tried to kill him. He wanted to kill him. And that, I mean, that's the kind of thing, we talk about church hurt, that's, that's the kind of thing where people who are supposed to be like a father to you turn against you. Uh, that's the thing that David walked through and, and worshiped. We talk about rejection, you know, the thing with his, his biological dad at the beginning of the story. I mean, that's the kind of thing that people walk through and they, they stop blessing the Lord with their soul. They stop choosing to believe that he's good. They let that door flood open and then they get in a place of despair. Those are the kind of things, but man, look at David's sin. Look at what he, look at the, the situation with Bathsheba and the fact that that kind of thing, a lot of people give up trying because they feel worthless and a lot of people tell them that they are. But David, he stood strong because he knew how to bless the Lord with his soul. He knew how to command his soul into a place of blessing and into a place of praise no matter the circumstances. The habit that I've gotten into over the last several, you know, five years now is that I open the Psalms and I write them. And I'll read them just like this Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. And, and in my writing my prayers, it'll look something like this. It'll say, I'll read that and I'll say, Lord, I want to bless you with all of my thoughts and all of my choices and everything that I feel. I don't want to forget your benefits. Who forgives all your inequities? I'll write, Abba, you forgive my inequities. Who heals all your diseases? Abba, you heal my diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction? You have redeemed my life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? You have crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercies. And I'll read these things and pray them and borrow the language of someone who did it well. Because David did this well. Because he navigated loss and he navigated disappointment and he navigated hurt, he navigated it well. And at the end of his life, he was still called a man after God's own heart. And I wanna be called that. I wanna be called one that was after his heart. I'm gonna borrow this language until, I'm, until I speak it fluently. And now I don't have to go to the Psalms as much as I used to. Now I can sit down and in the midst of loss and in the midst of being laid bare and the question being asked, what do you actually believe? I can sit down and say, I believe that he crowns me with loving kindness, that he heals my diseases, that he's forgiven my inequities, that he's pulled my life up out of destruction. These are the things that I believe and I know to be true and it's a language that I learned because there has to be a choice at some point that we say we will bless the Lord with 
with the entirety of our mind, will, and emotions. We will feed our spirit. And whenever we feel that our flesh has the upper hand, whenever we get to the point of weakness, that's whenever we call out on Him to be strong where we're weak. That's when we call out. We're not, we're not forsaken because we haven't been feeding the right thing because He sees us as His son. Whenever God looks at us, after we have, have, have come and said, okay, Jesus, I'm making the choice. I want you to sit on the throne of my life. The struggle for righteousness at that point is over and we just have to walk in it. I am not condoning sin. Every time I talk about this, somebody is like, oh, you know, a bunch of scriptures about holiness. And let me tell you, I believe entirely in holiness. I believe in that as a fruit of the righteousness of God. I believe that holiness comes because as we are conformed in to his image because he made the way for us to be that we become holy we become like him because whenever we are so hungry for the word the world doesn't taste good we don't want it but if we go after looking like holiness without any heart connection we've missed it because the purpose of all of this was not because he wanted uh you know he, that he wanted little spotless obedient children in that sense he wanted a heart connection with a bride he looked at us as his precious children and it wasn't about jumping through hoops it's not and i will stand on that 100 percent all the time for the rest of my life because i have seen so many people follow all all the rules and have hard hearts and that is exactly what he didn't want to happen what he wants is he wants us to know his goodness and know him and draw near to him because the problem is is when the door gets open and his goodness gets calls into question and we no longer say bless the Lord oh my soul we say he's not worthy to be blessed because he lets all of these bad things happen we at that point forfeit our authority and forfeit everything that he's given us in order to inf in impact the world, impact the brokenness. The question, why does God let bad things happen? God created out of an overflow of his goodness he made man to be in relationship with. And it got broken because man chose sin, okay? But God wanted real lovers. He didn't want automated robots. He didn't want slaves. He wanted real lovers. There's no love if there's not choice. If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you know that all of your choices were stripped so that you would love somebody. You understand what that's like. That's not what God is. He's not an abuser. And so he gave choice. He put the tree that was forbidden in the garden because with no choice there would have been no sincere love. And he was looking for sincere lovers. And he was not punishing them when he removed them from the garden when they made that choice he still blessed them to the fullness that he could and he cursed the land and he cursed the snake and he made he made Adam and Eve clothing and sent them out of the garden he covered them and sent them out of the garden because it had he left them to stay in the garden they could have eaten from the tree of life and stayed in brokenness forever he sent them out of the garden because he loved them and because he knew that there was an unfolding of a restoration and man lived in brokenness from Adam to Jesus. Man lived in this brokenness and in this separation from God, but the whole time you see God coming in and fighting for connection with man. You see instances like David that were choosing to bless the Lord with their soul, that were choosing to praise Him, and you see Him being strong on these people's behalf, and then Jesus comes. He becomes a man. You know, He wasn't before. Before He was born into the earth, He wasn't a man. He had never worn skin before. And he became a man. He was born. He'll be a man forever because of that choice. With knees and eyelashes and eyebrows. Like, truly, think about that. I mean, he's a man. And he became that for us because it took a man to take back the authority that God intended for humanity to have on the earth. Because Adam relinquished his authority. He'd been given dominion over the earth to subdue the earth and he relinquished his authority to the enemy and Jesus as a man came and he took it back because he understood the fullness of what a relationship with a man was supposed to look like with the father and he walked it out and he took back that authority do you know that he rose on the third day because he said he would that's that's how you know i wondered that for so long i thought how was that how did he get up did god snatch him out how did that happen do you know that he said this temple will be destroyed but on the third day it will be rebuilt it will rise up on the third day he put a timestamp on it and he put the word and this is the very same word that spoke every 
everything into existence and his word hung in the air until the third day came and that very word resurrected him because he said he would he did because he said he would the word that was the creative word the word that spoke everything into existence hung in the air until the third day and it lifted him up he took the authority back for mankind we're made in his image we're made in his image that means that that we with our words are made in his image. We have the ability to speak life and death. The reason why I say I bless you at the end of these videos and so many people will ask me, how can you bless anybody? God's the one who blesses people. I understand that. Every single good thing comes from him and he made us in his image with the power of blessing and cursing on our tongue. We've got to start blessing people. We've got to start blessing our land. We've got to start blessing our gardens. We've got to start blessing our brothers and sisters. And we've got to start telling our soul to bless the Lord. The reason so much bad happens in the world is, and, and we keep looking at God saying, how could you let that happen? How could we? How could we let that happen? And so I, I really think the first step to seeing a lot of restoration in our earth and seeing a lot of... Um, freedom come to the people who are in captivity and there are a lot of people in captivity sex trafficking is a really real thing a lot of babies die every day through abortion a lot of babies are abused a lot of people are abused but that's not the extent of the brokenness go to the store go to the mall look around they're hurting and broken people all over because somebody needs to stand up and say i bless the lord with my soul and i'm going to look past my circumstances and i'm going to shut the door on the idea that he's not good and i'm going to start walking in the authority that he gave me to bring about change into this broken earth <laughs> George. I really don't know exactly how to cover all of this topic in one 30-ish minute devotional and part of the reason why I've been holding off on doing one of these is because I kind of feel like I'm gonna explode sometimes like I just feel like there's so much that I want to say and there's so much that I feel but more than anything I need to apply it I need to walk in it you know, we can't teach anything that we're not walking out. I guess the summation of all of this is I'm sitting in my garden that just got zapped by the frost and we'll all be turning black in the next couple of days. And as the house next door is missing her mom and as all the things that I believe have been laid bare and I've been asked the question, do you really believe this? The answer is yes. And my choice is to bless the Lord with my soul and to speak a language of praise. And when I look at all of the brokenness in the world, I'm not gonna sit back and cross my arms and say, he must not be good because he allows that to happen. Instead, I'm gonna stand up in the authority that I've been given. And I'm gonna speak to those things. And I'm gonna apply kindness where I can. And I'm gonna give to them where I can. And with all the resources that I've been given, I'm gonna affect change. Because when we believe he's actually good, we believe he's actually given us the ability to do that. Coming to a place of not believing that, it robs us. It robs us of life abundant in our own life. It robs us of fruit. It robs us of relationship. And it robs us of the ability to make anything better for anybody else. I bless you. <laughs> Until next time.